A letter to the exiles from Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 7. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, yes, you too will prosper. Several years ago, a man got onto a boat and left his home, left his place of familiarity, and arrived to a new emerging country. This man, by necessity, went to the city, a city that was quickly developing. And he worked there for a year, scrounging up a handful of coins, a meager income, but yet a respectable one. And after that year, when he had saved up just enough, he left the city and bought himself a shovel, which he used to dig a hole, and then he placed a tin sheet over that hole and called it home. Once the man had a home, he was able to send back news to his wife and child and tell them that he was ready for them to come too. And so they did. And they lived in this home, along with several other people who had built homes similar to this on the outskirts of the city. This developing city was the city of Toronto in the 1920s. Doug Saunders is an author and a writer, a historian, and he writes in his book called Arrival City that These places, these transitional spaces, he calls them, have a significant impact on changing and morphing the city that is. He calls these places arrival cities, people who arrive. And these change the economy, the community, and so cities emerge from that, They shift, they evolve. Israel finds themselves in one of these transitional spaces in Jeremiah. They're living in exile. They're living amongst a group of people that you would not have called the nicest neighbors. And so Israel did what probably many of us would do, They stuck to their homes. They stayed isolated within what was familiar, the people they knew, the people they were raised with, God's people, not the other people. And so then God sends Jeremiah a prophet with an interesting prophecy, a prophecy to leave your fenced yard and settle down in the place that I've put you. It's an interesting word. And yet it meets us often where we're at as well. I don't know about you, but I'm a person of creature comforts. I'm quite content to stay at home where I don't have to go talk to strangers, where I don't have to leave my place of familiarity. 
and I remain content, safe in that. And so a word like this from Jeremiah confronts me, confronts me with a way that I often look at the city. The city can be a scary place, filled with people that we don't know. Our homes within those cities can be familiar, and yet there's so much unfamiliar about the cities that we live in. Oshawa is an arrival city in many ways. It is in a transitional moment. It is a transitional space. Oshawa, if you didn't know, is the fastest growing city in Canada right now. In the pandemic, it was ranked one of the top cities to move to in a place of transition in our world. And so it's so interesting that Oshawa, the armpit of Ontario, is now seen as a place on the leading edge. And so people watch with curiosity, what's happening there? And so it meets us as a church, as a church that exists to live in relationship with God and people and our city. What does it look like to live in mission within the city in which we live? What does it look like for us to settle down in the city, to get to know our neighbors, to seek the welfare of the city and see that prosper? For me, it's even a mind shift to know that God wants to see the city prosper. And he uses his people to help with that redemptive plan. I've been reading a book called Loving the City by Timothy Keller. And there was one particular quote, one particular segment in this book that I wanted to read for us because it struck me. It really struck me this week. He asks a question. How should Christians respond to these ways in which the city challenges us. We must respond with the gospel, Timothy writes. And how exactly does the gospel help us face these challenges with joy rather than fear? Obviously, it is true that we must bring the gospel to the city and hear the gospel while in the city. But we must also recognize how much the city itself brings the gospel to us. The city will challenge us to discover the power of the gospel in new ways. We will find people who seem spiritually and morally hopeless to us. We will think those people will never believe in Christ. But a comment such as this is revealing in itself. If salvation is truly by grace, not by virtue and merit, why should we think that anyone is less likely than ourselves to be a follower of Jesus? Why would anyone's conversion be any greater miracle than that of our own? The city may force us to discover that we don't really believe in sheer grace. That we really believe God mainly saves nice people, people like us. We talk a lot about outreach in the church. It's a word that has a lot of great intention and a lot of great heart. And yet I know for me the struggle with outreach is that it made me think that it is my job to reach out and help someone else. I myself can go and save someone else from their misery or from their problem. I was talking with a friend of mine who spent years church planting years ago and was talking about this word and he stopped me. He said, William, 
the city, the people of the city don't need you to come in and save them from themselves. People of the city need someone to come alongside them, to live in relationship with them. And that's exactly what this friend of mine did. His church plant came alongside the people of his city, going to city events, going to parades, showing up at kitchen parties, being part of the life, seeking the welfare of the city and the people there. One last story. I was working here at the church. This was a couple years ago now. And I heard a knock on the door. And so I went down, and there was a man holding a cardboard box. So I opened the door. And the man asked if he could come in to use our washroom. Sure, no problem. Come on in. Welcome. And so he went to use the washroom, and he took his cardboard box with him and spent some time in the washroom. He plugged his phone in so he could charge it while he was here. And when he came out, he had several wet shirts, which he hung on some chairs, of course, asking if it was okay. Yep, no problem. So he said, can I sit for a while while I wait for my shirts to dry and my phone to charge? Yeah, of course. Take a seat. And so we sat down, and he put his cardboard box beside him. We began chatting for several minutes. It became clear to me that this cardboard box carried all of his possessions, a phone charger, a couple shirts, a pair of socks, some papers and magazines, and a few cans of Coca-Cola, four to be exact. He was kicked out of his home the night before and had just enough time, he said, to grab some essentials. And so here we were, sitting on the church step. We're talking, and he says, William, would you like a can of Coke? I'm not a huge soft drink drinker um, and wasn't, hadn't had a Coca-Cola in years. Um, but to say no was not an option in this moment. So I said, absolutely. And so we both cracked our cans and sat on those steps right out there, looking out the window at the city, enjoying a conversation. We talked for maybe 10 or 15 more minutes, and he packed up his wet shirts into a plastic bag, and off he went, and I never saw him again. And yet, I will never forget that moment, because it was in that moment of thinking that I was helping someone that I was indeed helped. I was shown the deepest act of hospitality and grace that I had experienced before. This is city vision. Looking out at a place that the Lord does call us to seek the welfare of, but also recognizing that we're going to receive the greatest welfare as we come alongside a city. The city will remind us of the power of God's grace power of the gospel. And just as that power can change our hearts, that power that doesn't come from us, like we've heard, will change, will morph, will grow, will transform the city. And what an act of grace that God uses people like us to be part of that plan. It's a beautiful thing. As we look to the city and see its deep need for grace, the city mirrors our deep need for grace as well. Amen.
Let us pray for our city. Lord Jesus, you wept over a city. You would have wrapped your arms around Jerusalem, but it would not allow you. Through your tears, you saw a city worthy of love. You saw a people in need of love. Today, we pray for our mayor and our city council that they would always see this city of Oshawa as a place worthy of love, that they would always see our city as a place in need of the kind of love that wraps its arms around. We pray that our city's leadership would look to you for direction as they develop programs and set budgets that reflect the vision of love. We pray that you would be their strength, that they would seek to act justly and with kindness. May we, Zion Church, as willing partners, because of your love, be emboldened by your spirit to be a place of hospitality and community with our neighbors in your name. And as instructed in Jeremiah, put it on our hearts to pray for our city and show us how to contribute to its flourishing. The city is a place of neighbors and neighborhoods, industry and commerce, education and learning, gardens and trees, arts and music. It is also a place of brokenness, and it is a place of great spiritual need. Lord, shine your light in the dark places. Your kingdom come, Lord, bringing love and hope, liberation and healing. Lord, may this city be to you to you, a place of joy and praise and full of your glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. May it be so.